you know, ladies and gentlemen, one of my ambitions is to, is to write a book. Like many comedians, I, I'd love to write a book, but I don't really want to write a novel, because I don't know if you've ever read a novel by a comedian, but they're shite. <laughs> we don't seem very good at it, but, you know, it requires having an idea that lasts more than 30 seconds. Not going to happen. So what I thought I'd do is a, is a book of correspondence, because that way you're getting someone else to do half the work. <laughs> oh, yeah, always thinking. Would you like to hear them? Yeah. Well, good, good, otherwise we'd be having some quiet time. <laughs> This is, the, this is the first letter that I wrote. It's to my, uh, my local MP, uh, Chris Smith. Dear Mr. Smith, do you get tired of people writing to you who are clearly just wasting your time and have nothing better to do? <laughs> this is to uh, Charlie Statham, who's the head doctor of NHS Direct in West London. Dear sir, I heard about a doctor that took out someone's appendix with a coat hanger on a plane. Now, I'm not a qualified doctor, but I do take an interest and I've got all the proper kit. Could you talk me through the procedure? Please write back soon, she's in terrible pain. <laughs> Is anyone in here a member of Amnesty International? I think someone's timidly put up a hand at the back, but are you worried about being persecuted? <laughs> Well, I, I wrote a letter to the head of Amnesty International in the UK. I hope you like it. It's to Kate Allen, director of Amnesty International UK. Dear Madam, I like what you people do. <laughs> Writing letters to complain about human rights violations is like a political version of points of view. <laughs> the BBC, or fascist leader, may not change what they do as a result, but at least you'll slow down their day as they wade through the post bag. <laughs> I'd be surprised if they got round to torturing anyone before 11.30, the number of letters you send. <laughs> Lots of people do nothing because they know they cannot change the world. But you good people are not deterred from making futile gestures on behalf of human rights. And I, for one, applaud you. Inspired by your unilateral approach, I decided to hold a fundraising dinner on your behalf at my home. I charge people £20 a head to come and enjoy a meal and drinks, with all profits to go to Amnesty. Although a success creatively, we went for a South American theme, unfortunately the groceries were expensive, as was the booze, and in the end I made a loss. You now owe me £57.40. <laughs> now Amnesty, God bless them, got back to me almost immediately with this letter. To be honest, it's a little bit condescending. Dear Jimmy, thank you for your letter. I was delighted to hear that you're a supporter of Amnesty. You do appear to have a few misunderstandings about the work we do. So I've enclosed a copy of our new information leaflet, What We Do. <laughs> Which, fair enough, is a very good name for an information leaflet. I've also enclosed a copy of our new annual review, Human Rights Before Profit. Which I've had a flick through and is no way to run a company. <laughs> Regarding your recent fundraising dinner, I'm sorry to hear that all the energy and creativity which you put into your event did not result in you being able to make your planned fundraising donation. I usually advise our supporters to start small and build up with their fundraising. It's also an excellent idea to work out a simple budget beforehand. <laughs> and to have a think about just how many people you can attract as guests to your event. This helps immeasurably with planning your expenditure and setting your ticket price and hopefully will ensure a different outcome at your next fundraiser. In terms of your request that Amnesty reimburse you for the loss, I'm afraid I will have to say no. <laughs> well, I was very disappointed and £57.40 out of pocket. But I had a money-making idea. Who buys fair trade products here? Anyone? Quite a few of you buy fair trade. You know, the tea, the coffee, the sugar, that kind of thing. I had a bit of, you know, I think I spotted a gap in the market, so I wrote them a letter. The reason I'm writing is I think I've spotted a gap in the market. <laughs> Told you. <laughs> no one is more exploited than the farmer of the coca leaf. Whilst drug barons get rich exploiting both third world farmers and first world recreational users, we stand by and do nothing. I propose a fair trade cocaine joint venture. I have a contact in distribution. And you guys have the perfect cover to sell through customs. Who knows, if it all takes off, we could end up millionaires. Brackets and help the poor. I wrote this one to Martin Bell. You know Martin Bell, the man in the white suit, political campaigner? Dear Mr. Bell, your personal assistant is keeping things from you. <laughs> now, I've not had a reply to that, which would seem to suggest I'm right. <laughs> I 
This is one that I wrote to, in terms of taste and decency, we take a bit of a dark turn here, let's be honest. Um, it's a letter that I wrote to David Yelland when he was editor of The Sun. Dear Yelland. <laughs> I thought that was good, tabloidy strong. Dear Yelland, there's been a lot of talk about genetic engineering. Obviously, it's a very complex area. Could you tell me, is it wrong to breed piglets specifically for the purpose of weaning paedophiles off babies? <laughs> Only I'm thinking of starting a company with a slogan, they'll squeal, but not to the cops. <laughs> I think it's morally acceptable to write that letter. I think it's okay to laugh, but to applaud, really, that's in very bad taste. <laughs> I wrote this to Sir John Stevens, the Metropolitan Police Commissioner. Dear Sir John, I've got a bet on with a friend. I say most policemen are just nice guys doing their job, whereas he says all coppers are cunts. <laughs> Which is it? 